Hello and welcome to another Ginger Mathematician video. So today we're going to go through A-level maths, paper one, everything on differentiation. And you're going to see lots of different kinds of questions with differentiation. In fact, it's one of the biggest topics that appear on paper one, according to my predictions. If you haven't seen my previous predictions, then check out the video above. So I'm going to go through your standard questions on differentiation, working out stationary points, and also looking at a little bit of related rates of change. And if you want a more detailed video, on one of those particular topics, then do let me know in the comments below. Right, let's get started. So we have question three here. It's one of the easiest style questions. So a curve has equation y equals 1 over 60, 3x plus 1 all squared, and a point is moving along the curve. Find the x coordinate of the point on the curve at which the x and y coordinates, this is a slightly strange question, are increasing at the same rate. So as soon as I see the phrase rate in a mathematics question in A level, then I'm thinking differentiation before anything else. And one of the skills to build up on a paper one is knowing what skills you need for these particular kind of questions. I see that word rate, I'm thinking differentiation. Notice we're looking for the x and y coordinate to increase at the same rate. So if the x coordinate goes along by one, then we go up y by one. Or if we go x by two, then we go y by two. So essentially, we're looking for when the y change and the x change are the same. Well, if we go back to IGCSE mathematics, if we work out the gradient here, well, one divided by one is just one. Here, two divided by two is equal to one. So essentially, what the question wants us to do is assume that dy by dx at this coordinate is equal to one. So the change in y over the change in x. That's going to become important later on in the question. So since we see rate, the first thing that makes a lot of sense to do here is to differentiate the function. So here it's slightly less straightforward because we've got this bracket and the squared here. I'm going to show you my quick way of using the chain rule to save yourself time in the exam. So the way I differentiate this, first of all, is we're going to take the two, and just like in normal differentiation with x squared or x cubed, we're going to bring that to the front. So we get a 2 times 1 over 60, so that stays where it is. And now we differentiate what's inside the bracket. So I focus on what's inside the bracket here. So if I differentiate 3x plus 1, well, I'm just going to get 3. Okay, It's a linear function. It's got a gradient of 3. So I can put a 3 here. Now I take the entire bracket that I had before, and I reduce the index by 1. So I'm going to put that as a 1 here. Now, if this is slightly confusing at this particular point, don't worry. This is a long video. We're going to do lots and lots of practice of using the chain rule, product rule, quotient rule, and things like this. So if we simplify this down now, well, 2 times 3 is equal to 6. So we get 6 over 60. And notice 3x plus 1 to the power of 1. Well, that's just 3x plus 1. And we can simplify this down further because 6 over 60, that's equal to 1 over 10. So our derivative of this function, dy by dx, is equal to 1 over 10, brackets 3x plus 1. Now we use the fact that we talked about at the start here, is we want to find out when the x and y coordinates are increasing at the same rate. That means dy by dx is equal to 1. So at this point, we're going to substitute in dy by dx is equal to 1. So notice this expression is equal to dy by dx. Therefore, what we can say here is that 1 over 10 brackets 3x plus 1 is equal to 1. So we can equate that to this idea it's increasing at the same rate. Here it's now just an equation to solve. So the opposite of dividing by 10 is timesing by 10 on both sides. This cancels, leaving us with the bracket 3x plus 1. And 1 times 10 is equal to 10. And then, again, this is standard IGCSE stuff at this point. We're going to minus 1 from both sides and then divide by 3, giving us our x coordinate of 3, which is our answer. Notice you should always look at the question. It just wants the x coordinate of the point. It doesn't want the y coordinate, but it could ask for that. I think in the very next question, it does ask for the actual coordinate. So do read the question nice and carefully. 
Okay, so have a look at the mark scheme there. Get a nice four marks to pick up and build yourself some confidence at the start of the exam. On to our next question. Now we've got a question nine here, so this is going to be a bit more tough. We're still going to be using the chain rule here in a slightly more difficult context. So we're told here the equation of the curve is equal to this horrible looking function. The x is greater than minus a third. And we want to work out both the first derivative, so dy by dx, and the second derivative as well. So let's just take this nice and gently. So y equals 3x plus 1 minus 4 brackets 3x plus 1 to the power of a half. If I was to say which topics I really do enjoy at A level and IB, certainly trigonometry and calculus, and they can obviously combine, would be my definite favourite. So this is great fun for me. Right, so we want to differentiate this. So we just take each part of the expression at a time. So if we differentiate the 3x, we just get 3. Um, if that's slightly confusing, if I put this over here, but if you want to derive this, we bring the 1 to the front, 1 times 3 is 3, we reduce the index by 1, which is x to the power of 0, x to the power of 0 being 1, so then we just get 3. That's the kind of official process you're doing here. Uh, the plus 1, because it's just a constant, it disappears when we dif uh, differentiate, and now we need to differentiate this uh, looking thing. So we take it in the same way that we did before. We bring the half to the front, like so. We're going to write out all the steps. So 4 times a half. Then we differentiate what's inside the bracket. So that's just going to be 3. And then we're going to write out the entire bracket and reduce the index by 1. So we start with a half. We're going to minus 1 from that. That gives us then minus a half. Now we can do a little bit of tidying up here. So we've got 3 minus, so we've got 4 times 3 is 12, 12 times a half is 6. So the front here is just going to become 6, and the rest will stay as is. So dy by dx, in this case, is just equal to 3 minus 6, brackets 3x plus 1, to the power of minus a half. And now the second derivative, we just take the answer that we've just done here, and we're going to differentiate again. So we've got d2y over dx squared. So we're going to take our function. Uh, notice the 3 is a constant, so that's going to disappear. And now we do exactly the same process that we did before. So first of all, we've got the minus a half. <coughs> so we're going to bring that to the front. So we get minus 6 times minus a half times the differential of the bracket inside. So that's going to be 3 again. And then we write out the bracket and again, reduce the index by one. I'd be amazed how many students make a mistake at this point. If we've got minus a half and we minus one from it, we're going to get minus three over two. Make sure you remember your negative numbers. It comes up. Uh, if we simplify this down at this point, so we have minus six times three is minus 18. Minus 18 times minus a half. Minus times a minus is a plus. 18 divided by two is equal to 9. So again, just take your time with those negative numbers, because it could be a place where you make a mistake. And then if you look at the next part of the question, part B, you won't be able to do that particular part of the question. So on to part B, and this is very, very typical on A-level maths paper one, which is find the coordinates. So notice we need x and y here of the stationary point. Again, that's going to be one of those trigger words it's going to make us do something of the curve and determine its nature. So whenever it says determine its nature, what it's asking for here is whether it's a maximum, a minimum, or a point of inflection. So that's what it's asking for in this question with determine the nature. Right. As soon as I see stationary points, the first thing that comes to mind, I've done tons of these questions before, is dy by dx is equal to zero. That should be the first thing that goes to your mind. Now, we need part A here, so we need this part, and we're going to set that to zero. So the dy by dx is equal to zero. So we're going to copy across what we just did. 3x plus 1 to the power of, again, always double, double check, minus a half. You're amazed how many people just put a half and bad things happen. 
and this is equal to zero. So this is just an equation to solve here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is add this on both sides, just so I can work with some positive numbers, because I do like positive numbers, much easier to work with. Uh, at this point, I'm going to divide by six on both sides, so that gives me three over six, or a half, is equal to three x plus one to the power of minus a half. Get good algebra skills are really, really important for A-level maths. That's important to be aware of. At this point, we've noticed we've got a negative exponent here. So we can rewrite this as 1 over the positive version. So 3x plus 1. There are more than one way of doing this, uh, for sure. At this point, I'm going to cross multiply. So this times this, this times this. So that gives us then 3x plus 1 to the power of a half is equal to two. Now we don't really like this power of a half. So again, this is using these indices skills from IGCSE. If I square both sides, so if I square both sides, notice two times a half, that's equal to one, and that's going to cancel. So that gives us three X plus one is equal to two squared. That means then three X plus one is equal to four. And we're almost there. <laughs> So that means that 3x is equal to 3 and x is equal to 1. So after all that effort, x was just 1. Now, from there, we now know x is equal to 1. We want the coordinates. So notice we need to go back to our original function. So this horrible looking thing here. So y equals 3x plus 1 minus 4. Computer, stop. I'm doing some cooking in the background. So uh, we've got 3x plus 1 to the power of a half. So we're just going to substitute x is 1 in here. So when x is 1, just to work out the full coordinate, y equals, well, 3 plus 1 minus, and this gives us 4 to the power of a half. So 4 minus, now 4 to the power of a half, that's 2. The square root of 4 is 2. Uh, 2 times 4 is equal to 8, and that gives us minus 4. So the coordinate is going to be 1 minus 4, because we've now worked out what y is. But we haven't finished the question here, because we need to determine its nature. So this coordinate of 1 minus 4, whether it's a maximum, minimum, or point of inflection. So in order to work this out, we're going to need the d2y of the dx squared. So we need the second derivative. So I'm going to copy that across. So d2y over dx squared, 9 brackets 3x plus 1 to the power of minus 3 over 2. Again, double check. Always double check as you go over the page. And now we're going to substitute in the coordinates. So when x is equal to 1, we're going to pop that into our second derivative. And if we pop that in, we get 9 lots of... That gives us 4 to the power of minus 3 over 2. And if we work out this, well, that's going to be the same as 1 over 4 to the power of 3 over 2. So that's going to equal 9 times 1 over, well, the square root of 4 is 2, 2 cubed is 8. So we're going to get 9 over 8. And this is greater than 0. And if you have the second derivative greater than zero, that for that means that my uh, one minus four is a minimum point. So if this second derivative is greater than zero, it's a minimum point. If it's less than zero, it's a maximum point. Kind of almost anti-intuitive, maybe at, the, at very at first. And if it's equal to zero, then it's a point of inflection. So the final answer here is that 1 minus 4, I'm going to write this very clearly for the examiner, is a stationary, a stationary point, make sure it's got an A, and is a minimum. So make it very, very clear. I've got my answer, and I know it's a minimum. Okay, so you can check the mark scheme here, and you can look through everything I've done on this particular question. 
Okay, and on to question eight. Now we're going to do part A here because part B essentially wants you to work out the area that you see in front of you, which will be in my integration video to follow up. So the diagram shows the curve with equation y is x to the power of a half plus 4x to the power of minus a half. And this line coming across here, this is the line y equals 5. This intersects the curve at these two points here. So 1, 5 and 16, 5 as well. And what we need to do is work out the equation of the tangent to the curve at point A. So essentially what we're looking for here, if I actually draw this in, is if I just draw this tangent line just touches A and then comes down here. Now I like to do this as a sort of double check because when we do find out a final answer here, it's going to have a negative gradient and you know the y-intercept's going to be up here, so above 5. So keep that in mind when we actually check our answer. Now, as soon as I see tangent curve, as soon as I see that phrase, I'm going to be differentiating. So again, using those trigger words to help you here. So we're going to be differentiating this y equals x to the power of a half. A bit easier than some of the differentiation that we've done so far. So to work out dy by dx here, just to go through those steps, very important. We take this half, we bring it to the front, so we get a half x and then we reduce the index by one. So a half minus one, that's going to be minus a half. We do exactly the same process for the next part. So we take that minus a half, we bring it to the front. So we get minus a half times four, and then we want to reduce the index by one. So we have minus a half, we're gonna take away one from it. That's gonna be minus three over two. Now we can do a little bit of tidying up here, so the first part is fine. And then minus a half times 4, that's going to give us negative 2x to the power of minus 3 over 2. So we have our uh, derivative function, and now we want to work out the gradient at that specific point. So we want to work out the gradient at 1. Generally, with these kind of questions, they'll keep the numbers easy. They just want to test your understanding of the calculus involved. So when x is equal to 1, so we're taking this point here, we want to work out dy by dx at x equals 1. So wherever we see an x, we're going to put a 1. Well, 1 to the power of minus a half is just 1, so we get a half. And then, again, same argument here. So 1 to the power of minus 3 over 2 is still 1. So we get a half minus two, and that's going to give us then negative three over two. Again, being very careful with those negative numbers. If you have to write it out separately, that's absolutely fine. So we know the gradient is minus three over two. That matches in with our observation at the start. So I'm just going to write out y equals mx plus c. Can use the formula, the point formula as well. I tend to use this one most of the time. And all we do is substitute in that coordinate. So when x is 1, y is 5, double double check. So we get 5 is equal to, well, this is minus 3 over 2 times 1 plus c. So then we're going to add 3 over 2 on both sides. And that will give us, well, again, a nice little trick here. Just turn this into 10 over 2. And then you can add the fractions really easy at this point. So C is going to equal 13 over 2. So our final answer will just then be Y is equal to minus 3 over 2X plus 13 over 2. I've noticed, I mean, I've done A level and IB before. Some examples will get you to write it in a very specific form, the AX plus BY equals C form. I like leaving it in Y equals MX plus C form. But you'll see in the mark scheme here, They've left it in this form instead, where they can take a point in the gradient. Um, I tend to take this approach, generally speaking, whether I'm teaching IB or A level as well. So we get that final answer. Now we're on to the question that lots of students fear, particularly on A level maths at paper one. But again, all you need to do is go through it very carefully. There's a lot of words involved. I understand this. But if we just identify what each of these numbers represent, then we can lead ourselves to the answer using the chain rule. So water is poured into a tank at a constant rate of 500 cubic centimeters per second. OK, it's going to be important. The depth of water in the tank, t seconds after filling it, is h. 
When the depth of the water in the tank is H, the volume is given by this crazy formula. Doesn't say crazy in the question. This one here. And we want to find the rate, so we know differentiations involved. We see that word rate at which H is increasing at the instant when H is equal to 10 centimeters. Right, what does this mean? Well, let's start with the first part here. So water is poured into a tank at a constant rate of 500 cubic centimeters per second. Nice little trick here, use this in physics as well. Cubic centimeters represents volume. Seconds, of course, represents time. And because we're talking about rate, this represents dv, the change of the volume with respect to time. So by using the units in the question, you can work out what rate of change this is. So dv by dt, the change of the volume with respect to time is equal to 500. Okay, we want to work out the rate at which h is increasing when h is 10 centimeters. I see rate, h is increasing, so we want dh at the top. And this is over time, yeah, because as over time, this is going to be increased. So this is what we're looking for in the question. And this is where I put a question mark, because we don't know what that is yet. Um, there is one other thing that we do, do know, which is this horrible formula. So we have V is equal to 4 thirds, 25 plus H, all cubed, minus some very horrible big number, like so. Okay, well, in order to use the chain rule effectively, we need another derivative, okay, because we can then work with those derivatives. So what I'm going to do here is just derive, and it's always a good strategy just to derive things when you have to see a rate in the question. So you might get a couple of method marks just by doing this. So dv by dh, so we're going to differentiate with respect to h. Well, remember our rules, we bring the 3 to the front. Still got a 4 thirds there. And then we differentiate what's in the bracket. Well, we've got one H that would just differentiate to one. So actually we don't need to bring anything to the front, which is very, very helpful, but we do reduce the index by one. So we put the squared there. Notice this here is a constant. It's just a number, it's a fraction, but it's still just a number. So when we differentiate, we can ignore that. We're just gonna simplify this down. Notice the threes cancel. So we get four brackets, 25, plus h squared. Okay, so we've got something else to work with here. We've got a dv by dt, and we've got a dv by dh. However, we want dh by dt. I'm going to use a very nice use of the chain rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the following. I'm going to write dh by dv. So I'm going to flip this, and I'll talk about what that actually looks like multiplied by dv by dt. Now, why have I written that down? Well, the first thing is we know what dv by dt is. It's just 500. We do actually know what dv by dh is. It's this four brackets, 25 plus h all squared. That means that if we flip this, dh by dv, nice little trick, this is just, this also flipped, one over four brackets, 25 plus h squared. Now, the reason I've done that is even though we shouldn't think about this, mathematically speaking. When we have a fraction, we can cancel top and bottom. So notice, if I cancel the dvs here, I would get to dh by dt. This is just a, a use of the chain rule here. Now, by doing this, I actually get the rate that I'm looking for, because dh by dv is what I've just written here. So it's 1 over 4 brackets, 25 plus h all squared, multiplied by dv by dt. That's equal to 500. Now I can simplify this down because 500 divided by four. Again, don't forget your calculator. If you're panicking the exam, what that is, it's just 125. So we get 125 on top over 25 plus H squared. So we now have an expression for the DH by DT, and we want to find that change when H is equal to 10. So all we do is go when h is equal to 10, dh by dt, when h is equal to 10. So all we're going to do is wherever we see an h, we're going to put a 10. Unfortunately, this is one we can't work out in our head. So I'm going to use our handy calculator 
So we have divided by 25 plus 10 all squared, and we get 0 0.102, 0 0.04 dot dot dot. Generally, I do this to three significant figures. It's a general habit here. So 102. And then a quick think about units here. Well, we've got a change of h, that's just centimeters with respect to time, so centimeters per second. If you do physics, which probably many of you do, then you know this idea of units is very important. Reading the question, transfer it across to the answer. Okay, and on to our next question, which is kind of working backwards to what we've done already. I can see why a lot, lot of students actually found this quite tricky in the exam. So at another instant, so not the same time as before, the rate at which h is increasing is 0 0.075 centimeters per second. Notice I've got the height here, and I've got time. So what they've given us in the question here is dh by dt. So they've given us this, 0 0.075. And we want to work out the value of v at this particular instant. Okay, well, remember, we've still got this fact from before, this dv by dt is equal to 500. So we still have that. Now, the logic here that we want to do, actually, I want to work out what dv by dt is equal to. So I want to work out the change of the volume with respect to time. Okay, because we can actually use this fact here, this idea that this is 500, and then essentially equate them together. Now again, dv by dt, this time we want the dh's to cancel, so we need to think about how we want to structure this. So, with that in mind, we can do then dv by dh times dh by dt. Again, using that chain rule that we've seen before. Now we know what dv by dh is already, we already worked that out. That's this expression over here. So we know that's equal to 425 plus h all squared. dh by dt is what we're told in the question, which is times 0 0.075. And we know that these two things must be equal to each other, because we're told at the right at the start of the question, there's that rate of constant rate of change of 500 cubic centimeters per second. So we know then that this, using the chain rule, must be equal to the fact that we're given. Therefore, we can say that this plus h equals squared times 0 0.075 is equal to 500. This gives us an equation where we can just actually work out h itself. Now, if we do four times 0 0.075, that's going to give us 3 over 10, so 3 over 10, 25 plus h all squared is equal to 500. We're going to divide by the 3 over 10 here, so 500 divided by 3 over 10 is 5,000 over 3. I'm just using my calculator to help me here. Essentially what I'm doing here is making h the subject. So just finish this off on this slide, I'm going to square root both sides. So we get 25 plus h is equal to the square root of 5,000 over 3, and then we minus 25. Again, I like to try and keep things in exact values where I can, again, avoiding those rounding errors. Notice the root just goes over the first part here. So we've got an expression for h, you're thinking, but that doesn't answer the question. We want to work out the value of v at this particular instant. Well we have a formula that does this for us, what we underlined right at the start. So we know the value of h at this particular instant, and we can use that value of h to work out v. So to finish this question off, uh, we've got v is equal to, let's copy out the formula, 4 thirds, 25 plus h all cubed, minus something horrible, 62,500 over three. And now we're just going to replace our h value here. So when h is equal to, now just to keep it easier in terms of what we're writing down here, let me just pop this in. So that gives us 15.82. This exact value, 248 dot dot dot. And we substitute it into the formula, 
And if you pop it into the formula, this is what I've already done at home for you, you'll get your answer of 69,900 centimeters cubed for the units, so it's just volume. And notice this is also to three significant figures. So this is a tricky question, a kind of un not non-standard question, where this time you're given dH by dt, you work backwards using the facts that we have to work out a value of h at that instance, and then you can use that value of h to then work out v. So if you want more practice on this kind of question, which I suspect you probably do at home, then do let me know in the comments below if you want me to do a related rates of change video that's just specific to this particular topic rather than differentiation in total. Again, you can have a look through the answers here and you can see where you pick up those method marks as well. Okay, and on to our next question, which is question 11. As soon as you see double figures with these questions, you know they're gonna be a bit tougher. So we have the equation of a curve here and we're given this particular formula and K is a positive constant. And the first thing, which is reasonably straightforward, is we want to find dy by dx. Now, I much prefer writing this in this form, remember, a root can be written as the power of a half. It's going to make it much easier to differentiate in a moment. So let's pop this down over here. So we've got k, 4x plus 1 to the power of a half minus x plus 5. And we use our normal differentiation rules here to differentiate. So we bring the half. We take this half. We bring it to the front. So we have half times k. Now we differentiate what's inside the bracket here. So the derivative of 4x is just 4. So we just put a 4 down here. Hopefully this uh, differentiating using the sort of shortened chain rule is making sense at this point. And then we include the bracket 4x plus 1 and reduce the index by 1. So a half minus 1, that gives us then minus a half. Now differentiating what's left here, so minus x differentiates to minus 1, and 5 again is a constant, therefore that will disappear. So we just tidy this up slightly, so a half times 4 is equal to 2, so you get 2k, 4x plus 1 to the power of minus a half, minus 1. And we have our differentiated function in terms of k. Now, the second part here is you want to find the x-coordinate of the stationary points. That magic phrase, should, light bulb should be going off at this point, in terms of k. As soon as I see stationary point, I'm thinking dy by dx is equal to zero. Must be the first thing that you think of here. So we want to take what we just did here, this 2k brackets, etc., and make that equal to zero. So, therefore, we want 2k brackets 4x plus 1 to the power of minus a half, uh, minus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, so this is just a case of solving now, and we want uh, x in terms of k. So we've got a little bit of algebra to do here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to add 1 on both sides. So we get 2k, 4x plus 1 to the power of minus a half is equal to 1. Notice a negative exponent can be written as 1 over, so we can express this as 2k over 4x plus 1 to the power of a half is equal to 1. Um, if this is equal to 1, this fraction, then these two numerator and denominator must be equal to each other. Uh, we want x uh, on its own, so we want to put the x on our left hand side. And at this point, again, it's just going through our algebra process here. The reverse of square rooting, so the power of a half is squaring. So we square both sides here. This will give us 4x plus 1 is equal to 2k all squared. So be very, very careful. I've written this in separately. And 2k all squared, so 2k times 2k is 4k squared. Then we minus 1, so we get 4x is equal to 4k squared minus 1 and then divide through by four. So our final answer is 4k squared minus one over four. If you have struggled with the A-level maths, the paper one, the algebra involved, I'd recommend watching my IGCSE algebra video. So if you just type that into YouTube, you'll find it. And that goes through a lot of these kind of skills that you need to make sure are really fluent for when you do the paper one. 
So we have our final answer here. So x is equal to 4k squared minus 1 over 4. So far, so good. Now this is where it gets tricky. So we do need to read through this carefully. Given that k is equal to 10.5, so we're given what k is now, find the equation of the normal to the curve. Okay, we haven't seen a question like this. We've only been looking at tangents. Uh, at the point where the tangent to the curve makes an angle of tan inverse of 2. Okay, this has got a bit strange. With the positive x-axis. Right, let's work out what this tan inverse of 2 means. Let's go back to some trigonometry. Again, make sure you watch out the all of A-level trigonometry video as well. Very, very useful. So, I'm actually got a right angle triangle here. And I've got the angle, which is with a positive real axis. Okay, well, the positive x-axis. So down here, this is my angle. Let's call it theta. If I want to work out tan inverse of 2, remember tan, if you remember our function for tan, that's equal to opposite over adjacent. So if I want to get 2... I can make this 2 and this 1, for example. And if I was to use our sort of standard trigonometry here, so tan theta is equal to 2 over 1, which is 2, and therefore theta is equal to tan inverse of 2. Notice I didn't have to choose 2 and 1. I could choose 4 and 2, or 6 and 3. That would still give me 2. My point is here, what's the gradient of this line? So if you take the gradient here, well, the gradient is just right over run. So it's just going to be working with 2 over 1. And if we look at that, so change in y over change in x, then that's just equal to 2. Notice the gradient is always going to be equal to 2. This is a very strange way of basically saying that the gradient of the tangent line must be equal to 2. Now this is where we get between those higher grades. Yeah? Understanding that means the same as this. Once we understand that, then actually it's a fairly straightforward process from here. So first of all, we know k is equal to 10.5. So we take our derivative function, so dy by dx. Let's just write out in full first. Uh, 2k, 4x, plus 1 to the power of minus a half, minus 1. Okay, so what we want to do is first of all pop in k here. So k is 10.5, so we get 21, 4x plus 1 to the power of minus a half, minus 1. <clears throat> and what we're saying here, in order to work out the equation of the tangent to the curve, then the gradient must be equal to 2. So this expression that I have here needs to be equal to 2. And then we just solve in our normal way. So we're going to add 1 on both sides, so we get 21, 4x plus 1, Power of minus a half is equal to 3. Divide through by 21. 3 over 21 is the same as 1 over 7. So it's just knowing our algebra skills here. Notice we can do the flipping thing. I think we saw this uh, earlier in the previous question because we have a negative index. So this could become 4x plus 1 to the power of a half. But we have to flip this as well. So that's equal to 7. Then we square both sides. Again, we see the same process over and over. That gives us 49, and then we minus 1 and divide by 4. That's going to give us then x is equal to 12. So we found the x coordinate where the gradient is equal to 2. That's what we've done in that particular process. Now, before we can use this, uh, I think it's kind of useful now at this point to work out the y coordinate. So Remember, y, if we go right back to the start, is equal to k root 4x plus 1 minus x plus 5. Now, we know what k is. It's 10.5. So we get 10.5 root 4x plus 1 minus x plus 5. Again, double, double check. Always good to do. And when x is equal to 12, then we pop this in. So 10.5. 12 times 4 is 48, plus 1 is 49. Square root of 49 is 7, so this becomes 7. Uh, minus 12 plus 5. And you can use your calculator at any point here. I'm a bit allergic to the calculator a lot of the time. And if we work this out, minus 7 from that, I think we get 66.5. So we know 
the gradient of 2 occurs at this coordinate 12 and 66.5. OK, so now we actually know that. And we know x is equal to 12. Then what we can say at this particular point, the gradient is equal to 2. So this the gradient is equal to 2. Therefore, we want the tangent to, uh, that's the tangent gradient. But we don't want to work out the tangent, we want to work out the normal. So if the gradient is 2 for the tangent, the normal gradient will be the negative reciprocal. You should know that from the IGCSE course. So the gradient that we're looking for, we flip the fraction and we change the sign, in this case a minus. So we know then that the normal has the form of y equals a half x plus c. And we know the coordinate. This is a lot of effort we put into this to work out the coordinate. So we can use the coordinate to work out c. So when x is equal to 12, y is equal to 66.5. Therefore, 66.5 is equal to minus a half times 12 is minus 6. And then we add that on, and that gives us 72.5. So our final answer, so the actual normal that we've been looking for here, is equal to y equals minus a half x plus 72.5 for our final final answer to this pretty tricky four mark question. Okay, so you can check the mark scheme here. This is the first part, so 11 A and B. And then the second part here. Notice my uh, answer doesn't look exactly the same as this, but I've just been using the y equals mx plus c form. Notice or equivalent means they would accept my answer as well. And yeah, make sure you've looked through that nice and carefully. Okay, and on to question 10. Again, one of those double figure questions, so it could be a little bit on the trickier side. So we've got a diagram here showing the points A and B at these specific coordinates, and they're lying on a curve with equation 9x minus 2x plus 1 to the power of 3 over 2. And we need to work out the maximum point of the curve. Again, maximum point of the curve is one of those trigger phrases that we've been seeing through this video. First of all, we're going to need to work out what dy by dx is, and then set it to 0 to work out that stationary point at the top. Notice a maximum point is a form of stationary point. Now, if we look at our diagram, notice it's up here, our maximum point. So we're looking for something like a positive number and a positive number. So keep that in mind. So if we take our function, so y is equal to 9x minus open brackets, 2x plus 1 to the power of 3 over 2. And we're going to differentiate this following our trigger word that we saw. So if we differentiate 9x on its own, that's just going to be 9. If we differentiate this, this is where we be slightly careful. So we've got our 3 over 2. Bring it to the front. So we get 3 over 2 here. Then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the bracket. If I'm sounding like a broken record, that's good. We're getting enough practice in. The derivative of that bracket is 2. And then we keep the bracket as it is and reduce the index by 1. So 3 over 2 minus 1 is equal to a half. Now we'll do a little bit of tidying up here. So we have 9 minus 3 over 2 times 2. The 2's cancel, giving us 3. And then we have the rest here. And remember, we're looking for our maximum point here. So we're going to take this equation and set it to 0 and solve from here. First thing I'm going to do is going to add to this on both sides. So we get 3, 2x plus 1 to the power of a half is equal to 9. Again, making sure to keep the x term on the left-hand side. It makes it easier to work out at the end. Then we divide through by 3, giving us 2x plus 1 to the power of a half is equal to 3. Remember, we've seen this a lot, actually, on this particular paper. So the opposite of to the power of a half is squaring. So we want to square both sides. This cancels, leaving us... 2x plus 1, 3 squared is equal to 9, then we minus 1, so that gives us 8, and then divide through by 2, which gives us 4. Now this is not the final answer, 
because remember, if you go back, it wants the coordinates. It wants both the x and the y. But we can just take our answer. So when x is equal to 4, and just substitute it into our initial equation over here. So we get y is equal to 9 times 4 is 36. And the bracket, 4 times 2 is 8. 8 plus 1 is 9. So this is 9 to the power of 3 over 2. Then you can use your calculator if need be. Uh, the square root of 9 is 3. 3 cubed is 27. And then we have 36 minus 27. That is equal to 9. So the coordinates of the maximum point, I'm going to write it very clearly for the examiner, is equal to 4, 9. Again, it makes sense with our diagram. 4, 9 would be a logical place for that maximum point to be. OK, and on to a slightly unstandard uh, three-mark question here. Verify that the line AB is the normal to the curve at A. OK, so what do we want to do here? Well, first of all, we're talking about normals here. So notice that if I do a tangent line, so if I just draw a tangent line, if it is a normal line, that's a terrible line, by the way, it should be at a right angle. So we can do this in a few different steps here. What I would do is work out the gradient of the tangent line. And we've done this a fair bit in this video. And the way that I'm going to work out the gradient of the tangent line is take dy by dx and work it out at this specific point. So when x is equal to 1 and a half. So when x is 1 and a half. So I'm going to take my dy by dx that I worked out earlier. So this expression, and wherever I see an x, I'm going to put a 1 and a half, or 3 over 2. I tend to use improper fractions most of the time. Plus 1 to the power of a half. So we just want to work out the gradient of the tangent line. We don't need to work out the entire equation of the tangent line, but just the gradient. So we get three lots of, okay, these cancel, giving us 3. 3 plus 1 is 4 to the power of a half. So 4 to the power of a half is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. 9 minus 6 is equal to 3. Perfect. Now we work out the gradient of this line AB. I'm going to use a little bit of IGCSE knowledge here. So remember the equation, or the work out the gradient, we can use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Formula very familiar from the coordinate geometry. Again, IGCC coordinate geometry if you need more practice on this. And then we just need to substitute in the right values. So y2 is 3.5 here, minus 5.5, divided by x2, which is 7.5, minus 1.5. And if we do this, 3.5 minus 5.5 is minus 2. 7.5 minus 1.5 is 6. Minus 2 divided by 6 is equal to minus 1 third. And this is a very, very good sign because 3 times of minus a third. So if we times those two gradients together, that gives us minus 1. Therefore, AB must be the normal line. So remember that formula m1, m2 equals minus 1. That tells you if it's the normal and tangent relationship. And because we have that here, AB must be the normal to the curve at A. Nice when a plan comes together, like so. OK, so you can have a look at the mark scheme here. And you can see how we worked out all the different bits and pieces on that. And on to our very last question here. So we have a question three, so it's going to be an easier style question. And we have a curve that's got an equation with an a in it. Okay, Y equals ax to the power of a half minus 2x. x is greater than zero, a is a constant. Curve has a stationary point. Again, that key phrase at the point p. And has an x coordinate of 9. Find the y coordinate of p. Okay, stationary point. So again, dy by dx and equal to zero first thing that comes to mind. So if we take this expression, don't worry about the a, that will, it's just a constant, we'll treat it just like any other constant. 
So, first of all, we want to differentiate this. So we take the half, bring it to the front. So we get a half a x, reduce the index by one. A half minus one is minus a half. And the gradient minus two x, that's just minus two. Now we're looking for stationary point. So we make this equal to zero. However, we do know a little bit more information about this stationary point. It has an x coordinate of nine. So I can just replace the x with nine. So we get nine to the power of minus a half. And now we only have one variable to find out, in this case, the a, the constant. So let's work our way through. So we've got a half a, nine to the power of minus a half. Well, that's one over nine to the power of a half. That's one over three. Again, this is where indices are so, so important. Minus two is equal to zero. A half times a third, that's equal to a sixth. So one sixth a minus two is equal to zero. Nice bit of relaxing equation solving, adding two and timesing by six, giving us that then a is equal to 12. So we can actually express this uh, equation as 12x to the power of a half minus 2x. And now we know what a is when x is equal to 9. We can then just work out y. So y is equal to 12, 9 to the power of a half minus 2 lots of 9. 9 to the power of a half, the square root of 9 is 3. 12 times 3 is 36. 2 times 9 is 18. 36 minus 18, and that's going to give us our final answer for y of 18. So that is our answer. So just make it nice and clear, y is equal to 18. That is what we're looking for here. Didn't even need the extra page of working. That's lovely to see. So answer there is of y is equal to 18. Okay. Um, if you want any more uh, work on A-level maths, paper one, paper two, or any other paper in the A-level maths course, do let me know. If you want to keep up to date with any changes that Cambridge make to these particular papers, then do join my newsletter where I do keep you updated on these things. Again, you'll find that in the description and in the pinned comment below. And if you want to get up to speed on all things binomial, so binomial theorem on this particular course, then do check out the video right in front of you.